Um, it's really good, really good to be with you guys. Um, like Francis, he and I were talking at the beginning of the day, um, I've had a really actually challenging time uh, d discerning what I sh should share as a, as a part of this day. Um, because so much of what th this topic and what we're talking about today, and I think even the reason why Dan asked me to be a part of this is because the, the whole set of questions, every lab, every, all the topics, they're really important to me personally. Um, and, that, and that's because of my, my story. And so I think I just need to kind of set that to frame what it is I'm going to share. Because what I'm, I'm going to share, I don't know. You might be happy about it, and some of you might think I'm a heretic. I don't know. I can't, I'll let you be the judge of that. But uh, uh, in, in, in my mind, uh, something fundamental needs to shift in how Western, American, European Christianity, how it relates to the Bible. Um, I think the Bible uh, has essentially been hijacked by a whole series of Western traditions and ways of reading the Bible that don't honor it, they're not faithful to it, and I think they actually are crippling the church's witness in our culture. Um, and so uh, let me share a bit of my own story and, and why I, I care about all this so much. So I grew up in um, God's country, which is the great Northwest, and uh, the wonderful city of, of Portland, Oregon. Yeah. Portland, Oregon. Um, I, I was exiled in the upper Midwest for a while while I was doing my graduate studies in Hebrew Bible and stuff, but I made it back, and it truly is the most wonderful city in the world, in my humble opinion. Um, but uh, I grew up, um, my, both my parents are followers of Jesus. They're Christians. They're really remarkable people. Um, they, they were both artists, musicians, really bohemian type, and... Um, they both grew up in super strict religious homes, like crazy legalistic religious homes. And so they rebelled, and um, it was actually through the Jesus movement uh, that they came back to Jesus. And, and for a while it was smoke pot and follow Jesus, and then they lost the smoke pot part and just followed Jesus. But my earliest memories of what church is was just their friends gathering in our home, like as well, I was a tiny little guy. And that was interesting to me. And I, but I don't, know how, I don't know how to explain it. And my parents and I have talked about this. For some reason, I just, I expressed a, a hostility and a skepticism towards, towards Christianity or what I've come to call churchianity. Right? It's, uh, it's a form and an expression of the Christian tradition here in Western culture. And I, d I don't know why. They were sharing with me the other day. They remember this. I remember it too. When I was like 11 or 12, and it was not long after getting my first skateboard, which was a game changer for me, um, that I sat them down with a list of reasons of why I, I didn't want to be associated with Christianity or the church and why I didn't want them to make me go to church anymore. And so... Um, so they honored that decision. Actually, it was really brave. They asked me to go on like holidays and stuff like that. But they, they quit making me go because they wanted to maintain the relationship over the long haul as a means of helping influence me. Um, and so that was really important. I mean, that was a marked moment, and getting my first skateboard was uh, a really important moment too. And skateboarding culture in Portland is very different. Um, down here in California, you can be outside more of the year. That's why way more Californians are extroverts and so on. Uh, but Portland, you know, we have to live inside half the year. Not because it's cold, it's just mild. It's just mild, <laughs> right? Because you go move to Canada or live in the upper Midwest. That's cold. Portland is just wet, wet and mild. Uh, but, but that affected the way Portland skateboard culture uh, took shape too because you have to be very creative. You can't be outside a lot of the year and so you have to go underground um, and you have to find indoor places to, to skateboard. And somehow Portland skateboard culture was way more kind of nerdy, artsy, bookish, music driven. You, it was just different. It's different than the land of performance, high driven action sports or whatever, like with you guys down here. So P Portland is different. So for me, skateboard culture and my liberty from churchianity is, uh, in my teenage years uh, it was just identity shaping for me. I had a story. I had a tribe. I had all my clothes ready, picked out for me by Thrasher magazine. I just had to go get them at the, <laughs> the store. And it was my life. 
Um, I had this illusion that I could maybe take it somewhere, you know, as a career. Of course, that was the most ridiculous thing. Somebody should have told me the truth about that one, but whatever. Um, but that continued to shape because that's a very anti-institutional, anti-establishment type of culture, and I love that. Um, there was a, a church in Northeast Portland that um, in the late 1980s, there, there was a guy who moved up from San Luis Obispo to go uh, to Multnomah, which is a, a Christian college there. And uh, he just, he was a skateboarder and he saw a lot going on and in skateboard culture in Portland, but he saw like there's nobody effectively being a witness to skateboarders in Portland. So he uh, built an indoor skate park in the basement of a church building and he opened it up uh, for, in weeknights in 1987. And there weren't that many places. It was one of two dry places to skateboard at that point. The other place was underneath the Burnside Bridge downtown, right? <laughs> which was dangerous. Like I, we would go there, but don't be, go there at night. You'll get stabbed. So we, <laughs> so we would go to, go to skate church is what it was called, skate church. And it was a really great park, and you could go, um, pay a couple bucks, it was dry, everybody would go there, it was packed, scene, and um, all you had to do, you, you, had to, you could skate for an hour, and then um, they would have a break, they would turn off the lights, and um, some, one of the staff people would get up and give a Jesus talk. And if you sat through the Jesus talk, you could skateboard for the second half of the night. And that was skate church, and everybody went. And so I started going when I was 16, and I thought, these people are stupid, whatever, but it's a dry place to skate, so they're nice. That's cool. They let us come skate here. And so, um, so I, went for, I went for years. And, you know, unbeknownst to me, that Jesus was messing with me. <laughs> and over the years of me going and sitting in the back and thinking this was dumb and then starting to pay attention, and I'll never forget, because my t parents weren't pushing it on me. And so that's, I'm hearing the stories about Jesus and how he would treat people and, and the encounters people would have with him. And I'm hearing his teachings and his sayings and it's messing with me, you know? It's, it's sticking with me. And I'm, I remember thinking about it throughout the week and so on. And so a lot, very long story condensed. Um, I came to a point in my life, I was almost 20 years old, and I just surrendered everything to Jesus and I committed my life to following him. And that was the, the most, the most life-shaping decision that I've made, and I'm so grateful for that. But here's something that was interesting, and my hunch is that if you've grown up in churchianity, <laughs> Skate Church was my introduction to ch into churchianity as a 20-something, but my hunch is that you're gonna resonate with this. So I remember there was, um, there was a big skateboard ramp, and uh, the guy who started at Paul, one night for the Jesus talk, he was building a big half pipe, one of those big tall ones, you know, that goes like this. And he uh, had us all get up on one, edge of the ramp, and um, he, he, this was brilliant on his part, but he hadn't finished building it, and so a, a whole lot of the bottom wasn't completed yet, and so, you know, it's like vert ramp goes down to here, nothing, just frames and, you know, death if you were to drop into it, you know, <laughs> and, then, and then up the other side, and so he used this as an illustration, the fact that I remember it so much later means it stuck with me, but he was essentially saying, you know, like, like God's the creator, he wants to share life and the world with us. He's the maker of all good things. Uh, and that's a lot like this ramp. But uh, humans suck, and we do stupid stuff, and we're lame and whatever, and so we destroy each other and destroy God's good world to our sin. It's like we just ruined, it's like we just ruined the ramp, took it out. And so now we've got a problem, is that we live in a world that doesn't work right anymore. Because if you drop in on the ramp, death. You know, just careen into the, the abyss, you know, of the ramp or whatever. And then he just said, here's what's so awesome about Jesus. He loves the world, and he dropped in for you. And he fell into the abyss, and it destroyed him. But because he's God, he conquered death through his love. And then he's drawing this at the same time, um, this ramp. And so it was like the two halves of the ramp, and then the cross formed the bottom of the ramp, the horizontal beam of the cross. And so it's like Jesus completes the gap, and now all it takes is faith to drop in, and then you can come be here with God again and no longer step. It's very clever, isn't it? It's very clever. Um, you know it in some other, I think it's called the bridge illustration, right? But whatever, like you know this, this form. And so it, it stuck with me, and it spoke to me. Like that's what I needed to hear. It was very clear 
because I knew uh, that I uh, was not succeeding at being a human being come my late teens, that things were just not working out for me. And so, like, that resonated and it made sense to me. So here's what happened. I, for years, I heard stories about Jesus or this kind of way of thinking about Christianity. And it shaped how I thought about things. And so when I decided to follow Jesus, um, one thing I remember, it stuck out to me, is how much he quoted from and talked about his Bible, uh, what we call the Old Testament. And so I remember, okay, so you have a relationship with Jesus means having a relationship with this book, right? with God's Word. And so I, you know, I'm in my early 20s, and I'm reading, I'm reading the Bible for the first time. And it makes no sense to me whatsoever. I'm so bothered, and I'm confused, and I'm scandalized, you know, like the stuff that Dave was talking about earlier. You know, how many different verses about the sword are there in the Bible? And you just walk away so confused. And like the talking snake on page three sure didn't help anything, you know? And <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It's the Bible, and it's very strange. And if it's not strange to you anymore, just ask your coworkers or neighbors, and they'll remind you how crazy it is that you, thought, you know, think, think this is really important. This is very odd. It's very odd. But I knew, I knew that it was important. And so when I tried to understand the Bible through the storyline of this ramp illustration or the bridge illustration, um, this was essentially you know, the way the story was presented to me. You know, there's creation. You're going to know this, right? Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Tim, if you want to read and understand the Bible, um, here's the basic storyline here. Here's how Jesus fits into it. And, and creation, um, it's, you know, was about God made a, the world perfect and good, and then humans suck, and so we're not perfect and good. And so God um, has to punish us. He has to kill us, banish us from his presence. Um, but instead, Jesus came. And God punished Jesus instead of punishing us. And so we, um, God's going to rescue the world, and we go to heaven forever. Amen and amen. Yeah? Yeah. This is creation, fall, redemption, restoration. And that was the framework I was given to start reading the Bible. And then, I, and then I ran into a problem. <laughs> and that problem was the Bible. <laughs> right? So just, just work with me here. We've got this storyline here. So creation, the f first half of that covers pages one to three. <laughs> like right there. Right? And then you move from fall to redemption. That's about Jesus coming, right? So just work with me. Here we go, all right? Jesus, <laughs> right? Redemption and, and restoration. Do you, you guys see where I'm going here? So what's left unaccounted for? Are you with me? I was just, I don't know if you've ever done this illustration, but it's, just, it's very physical and tactile, and you just, the problem's very obvious. It's very obvious. I, I was mentored and shaped in an environment where the foundation story didn't account for the vast majority of the Bible. But I was told to read the Bible, right? I'm told to engage this thing, and, and every day I'm told to. But I wasn't given a framework for like, what does the majority of the Bible have to do with what you say is the story of the universe? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. And so uh, then it just be, it became even more uh, c confusing and, and so on. And so thus began my very early journey as a new Christian. I started signing up for Bible classes. I was, I, I was starting to teach the Bible to junior high skateboarders, and that was a hard audience to sell, right? <laughs> but it was great for me because I, I cut my teeth on t teaching and trying to communicate what Christianity and Jesus is to people. And my first audience was junior high skateboarders. And, and so it's just this long journey, and I went to school for far too long, and I, I mean, I, I, I just nerded out, like the ultimate nerd outness. Like, I just, um, Greek and Hebrew and the whole thing. Language, history, culture, I just became obsessed with everything to do with how, how, this, how the scriptures came into existence historically, but then too, how, how to 
think about what the Bible is and what it's for, exactly what Dave was saying, in a way that honors it, because this is actually what God has given to his people. Like this, not this, <laughs> not the beginning and just the end, like all of it. And so how does it hang, how does it hang together? Um, and so, uh, whatever, just Bible teaching and everything that I've been doing um, with this thing called the Bible Project is an attempt to tr try and bring a whole bunch of people with me on the journey that I had over the 15 years that I got to be in school for way too long. Um, here's uh, an interesting, I've already decided I'm going to, interesting, but I'm not going to show it to you now. Um, here's an interesting clue where, where I would start is if I want to immerse myself in the real story of the scriptures, not the shrunken down version, the real story, um, let's, let's take a cue from the first and uh, last pages. First sentence of the Bible. What kind of literature begins with the phrase, in the beginning? Narrative, narratives, stories. Not what well, some fairy tales do. But um, I, I don't think this is a fairy tale, right? So here's one, you know, somebody might debate that, but that's the whole point of the discussion. So uh, it's a narrative. It's a narrative. It's a story. If you turn to the last page of the Bible, the second to last paragraph, where John the visionary is concluding the epic uh, visionary tale that he's been uh, exploring in chapters 1 through 22, and the very last scene of the story world of the Revelation before the conclusion to the book and so on, is this line. And they, it's the servants of God in the new creation, and they will reign. Come on. <laughs> it's too good. It's like, in the beginning, plot conflict, long, long plot conflict. <laughs> Resolution, more tension, and they reign forever and ever. Whatever the Bible is, um, and Dave already kind of, you know, problematized for us uh, conceptions of the Bible as a rule book that dropped out of heaven, or as a theology answer book, or as a moral guidebook for every moral question you'll come across in your life. The Bible speaks to all of those things, to our character formation, to our deepest questions and our deepest longings. The Bible speaks to all of those things, but it does it in the form of an epic narrative. Epic narrative. And epic narratives are like, we hardly engage in them anymore except fairy tales or fantasy. The story world of Harry Potter, it's an epic narrative. Long periods of time, epic cast, tons of characters. By the time you get into book three, there's like 37 plot lines moving down the field together and all these subplots and characters. Any um, J.R. Tolkien fans? Exactly right. So epic narrative. It's a huge, vast world and you're brought into this swirling of about a ring, but it's also these kings and ancient kingdoms and elves and dwarves don't like each other. And this, so there's all these complex plot lines and they sometimes interlap and in all, long periods of time. It's an epic narrative. And the Bible it has that literary form to it. It claims that it's anchored in real historical events and so on, but it's an epic narrative about what God is up to and what God is doing. Um, so that's, first of all, this gives us a very clear clue as to what the Bible is. Um, and the key phrase that we've made, the mission of this thing called the Bible Project, that I'll talk about in a little bit, is that um, if we're going to reignite our imaginations about what the Bible is and be a part of releasing its power in our culture again, I think it's recognizing a very simple thing. The Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus and it has wisdom for the modern world. Which leads to a second observation about um, what the Bible is. Um, this is a <laughs> yes, I did sit down with a calculator and do this, but don't judge me. So, <laughs> um, if you, you know, if you talk to liter literature nerds and so on, they categorize different types of literature and world history and so on. Narrative is the most common form of human literary expression in human history. Uh, the second would be poetry. 
um, condensed speech that forms words together and phrases in dense, meaningful, usually creative combinations so that the effect on you emotionally is more than just the words. Narrative and poetry. And just look, like out of all the chapters in the Bible, if you just count them all up, what kind of literature is this chapter? What's this one? There's the breakdown right there. 43% narrative. 33% poetry. And discourse would be something like just normal speech like what I'm doing here right now. Moses' speech in Deuteronomy. Um, Paul's letter, all the letters of the New Testament are for the most part disc discourse. But so just look at the numbers right there, you guys. Like I, that just says something. When God wants to speak to his people, does he want to engage more our right brains or more our left brains? <laughs> more our logic brains side of our brain or our creative, imaginative, affective side of our brain? Isn't that interesting? So obviously both, but there's some things, what Dave was saying, one of the primary things the Bible is doing is not simply information transfer. It's trying to mess with you. It's inviting you into an epic story that it claims is the story of our world. And as you are invited into it and you learn about all of its characters who are mostly dysfunctional, this was another strange thing about churchianity that I did not understand, is that I'm reading all these stories about these really horrible people and the really bad decisions that they make. And then, like, I see representations of these stories in Christian children's media. And, like, none of that stuff's in there. It's just happy Noah, you know, and happy Gideon or whatever. And you're just like, my goodness, do you remember that part where Gideon said he would scrape the flesh off of his enemies with thorn branches? Like, why didn't that make it into Veggie Tales? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like, so it just shows you how captivated we are with this Bible as a moral handbook. And, if, and therefore, all the stories have to be cleaned up of anything that's scandalous because we're trying, that must be what they're for, these stories about how so I can be a good person or something like that. It's like, my goodness, that's exactly not what these stories, don't be like the people in the Bible, except the ones who come to the end of themselves after all of their flaws and failures and cast themselves on God's mercy and grace. Be like those people, but don't be like the way they are for most of their lives, right? So, sorry, that was a rabbit trail, but that was, uh, anyway. So, epic, in an epic narrative. And there's poetry, intense emotive literature that's trying to take you through an experience. Poetry is, is, a, is a literary experience. Its primary goal is not to communicate information. And a third of the Bible is in poetry. This is just a very simple observation, but I, I don't think we, we, this is just isn't even on our radar of our conversations about the Bible. Uh, because the way that the Bible gets presented to people in most churches is in the form of discourse. It's in the form of sermons and teaching, right? It's in the form of classroom education, because we think that's what the Bible's for. It's for information transfer. But the majority of the Bible is trying to do something else. It's trying to mess with you the way that the stories in, about Jesus messed with me <laughs> for years, right? That's how the Bible, that's how the Bible works. And so here's, here's what I would like to do. This is going to be very brief and as an overview, but I think we can do it. Um, I would like to try and walk through the epic narrative of the Bible in a mere 11 minutes. <laughs> what do I think I'm doing? <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I, like the, I like starting with creation. That's a good idea, isn't it? That's a good idea. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, but does God make a perfect world? Where does it say that in the Bible? What kind of world does God make? He says it seven times on page one. You know what I'm saying? What kind of world God thinks he's made? Is the difference between a perfect world in a good world, is that an important difference? That's an extremely, extremely important difference. Somehow there's this narrative that's captured churchianity's imagination. God made everything perfect. God made humans perfect. Humans broke God's law and fell from perfection. In fact, 
That's why we use the word fall, which is not a word actually used anywhere in the Bible to describe what happened in Genesis chapter 3. That's always been very weird to me. <laughs> why you all think that? So let's use biblical vocabulary, but we'll get there in a second. So God makes a really good world full of potential. Um, he stations some uh, creatures in it that he gives a job to. Who are the, what's the creatures' names? Adam. Adam, which is the Hebrew word for humanity. And uh, he says that humans are the image of God. Uh, the image of God, if you just read, read the story, it's not something humans possess, it's what humans are. They are the images of God. They are the physical embodiments that represent God's purposes and will and character as they go about doing their job. And what is their job? To rule. <laughs> right? To rule and subdue. To take all of the goodness that God has packed into his good world to channel it so that it doesn't just grow wild tomatoes eventually, but to channel the energy inherent within God's good world so that it becomes even more productive for more life to flourish. You make gardens out of the thing. To rule and subdue, to harness the world's energy. And then God gives them a choice. And what's the choice? The choice is, how are you going to go about building this world as the partners and images of God. They can trust God's definition of good and evil, right? This is what this, this tree represents here. There's knowledge of good and evil that humans are going to have to employ as they go about building the world. And so um, they can either trust God's definition of good and evil, which, by the way, is God a reliable provider of what is good? very good, right? Remember page one, seven times he says it, right? So yeah, God's a very reliable provider and definer of what is good. And so the tree represents this choice. Are they going to trust God's definitions of good and evil? And that way it's going to lead to access to the tree of life and good, good stuff. Or are they going to seize the opportunity to define good and evil themselves. How does the story go? It goes poorly. It goes poorly. Um, and what, they, what happens is not a fall from perfection. Just read the story. <laughs> right? the, the word in Genesis 4 uses the word, it's directly connected to its use in Genesis 3, is sin, which is the Hebrew word for failure. They fail to become what they were called to become. They failed the opportunity. They failed the chance to be, to be and realize God's purposes for them and for the world. And so what they do is they want to define good and evil on their own terms. Uh, the story actually says that it's a quest for wisdom. The woman saw the tree, that it was good for food, delightful to the eyes, and valuable for gaining wisdom. So this is a story about people wanting to define good and evil on their own terms, not on God's terms, as they go about building, building the world. And so, how are you guys doing? It's great, totally. Sheesh. Just watching that clock. <laughs> uh, so there you go. That's the story. It's a quest for wisdom. And so what, uh, what is God's response? He's heartbroken. He doesn't curse them. He curses that snake. <laughs> and he curses the ground. He curses the ground. And he says, as a result of your choice, the world that you have created by your decisions this is going to be hell on earth. And right there in the midst of that assigning of consequences, God announces that from the seed of the woman is going to come one who's going to crush evil at its, at its source. God can't even judge without being merciful. <laughs> in, on page three, on page three of the Bible. And so what they get is death by exile from the garden. 
And the story goes from the garden to then Cain, and then Cain murders his brother, and then he goes and builds a city where everybody's murdering each other, that guy named Lamech who sings a poem and has too many wives. And then the, uh, that leads to the flood, and then that leads to the great story of the city and the tower of Babylon. 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 Now, this is where you have to account for that huge portion of the Bible, right? right? That, that churchianity neglects and that we should stop neglecting. Let's just get a fresh start on this thing. And what God does is he calls the family of Abraham into existence. And what he says is God wants to bless all the nations through Abraham's family. Book and chapter, anybody? It's like one of the most important pages in your Bible. It's called Genesis chapter 12. Yeah, Genesis chapter 12. And so that's what God does. So this is very important. What God wants to do is take one family, call them out from among the nations that have failed, and he's going to do something with them and make them the vehicle of his blessing for all the nations of the earth. So right from page 12, God's on a mission to rescue and redeem all the nations of his world, and he chooses one family through whom he's going to do it. How are you guys doing? That's the Old Testament. Like, why, why is this stuff here? It's because on page 12 of your Bible, God chose not to parachute down packets of salvation to every individual human. Right? That's how Americans would do it, right? Because it's about equality, you know, and this kind of thing. So what God chooses to do is actually to weave his own character and being into the story of humanity by binding himself to this family, the family, the family of Abraham. And why is this part of the Bible so long and complicated? The, the family of Abraham are... Or what kinds of creatures? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're these kind. <laughs> They're these kind. People who want to redefine good and evil on their own terms. And so what you get is like hundreds and hundreds of pages. The story of Israel becomes the story of all humanity in a long, dramatic, explorative, epic narrative. Um, any fans of the Godfather trilogy? Um, you know, you don't, maybe, I don't know what you think about Breaking Bad and what that whole thing was, but it's very similar, right? Do, tragic stories, right? Tragic stories. Um, Hamlet, right? Shakespeare. These are stories extremely well told. They're very long. And the whole purpose is to give you a, an anatomy, play-by-play -play story of how this person destroyed their lives and everyone's lives around them. Why do we tell these stories to each other? <laughs> to depress each other? What's the value? It's very important. What's the value in telling long stories about people ruining their lives? Are these important stories for us to hear? Tragedies are extremely valuable stories. They give us windows into our own failures. And that's exactly what the story of Israel is. Because what, how does Israel do? <laughs> at fulfilling their calling to become a vehicle of blessing to the nations. They fail utterly. And so what uh, does God do? They go into the promised land. They're supposed to be a light to the nations and obey the Torah and they have the temple and everything. And what, what happens? They t utterly fail. And so what God does is he hands them over to the consequences of their decisions. And the consequences are death by what? Exile. Exile to where? Babylon. Now, uh, I could finish the story in this way, but now I'll just show you a Bible project video. How about that? <laughs> I think audio ought to work here. There's this beautiful poem. It's in the book of Isaiah. The city of Jerusalem has just been destroyed by Babylon, a great kingdom in the north. And all of these Jewish people, they've been sent away into exile, but a few remained in the city. And they're left wondering, what just happened? Has our God abandoned us? Right, because Jerusalem was supposed to be the city where God 
would reign over the world to bring peace and blessing to everyone. Now Isaiah had been saying that Jerusalem's destruction was a mess of Israel's own making. They had turned away from their God, become corrupt, and so their city and their temple were destroyed. Yeah, everything seems lost. But the poem goes on. There's a watchman on the city walls, and far out on the hills we see a messenger, and he's running towards the city. He's running and he's shouting, good news. And Isaiah says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Beautiful feet? Yes. The feet are beautiful because they're carrying a beautiful message. What's the message? that despite Jerusalem's destruction, Israel's God still reigns as king, and that God himself is going to one day return to this city, take up his throne, and bring peace. And the watchmen sing for joy because of the good news that their God still reigns. Now in the New Testament, we find this same phrase, the good news. It's the Greek word euangelion, and it's also sometimes translated with the word gospel. Yeah, so when Christians say, do you believe the gospel, they mean, do you believe the news? But not just any news. In the Bible, this phrase is always about the announcement of the reign of a new king. And in the New Testament, the Gospels use this phrase to summarize all of Jesus' teachings. They say that he went about proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. So Jesus saw himself as the messenger, bringing the news that God reigns. Yes, but the way that he described God's reign, it surprised everybody. I mean, think, a powerful, successful kingdom. It needs to be strong, able to impose its will, able to defeat its enemies. But Jesus said the greatest person in God's kingdom was the weakest, the one who loves and who serves the poor. And he said that you live under God's reign when you respond to evil by loving your enemies and forgiving them and seeking peace. This is an upside down kingdom. Now Jesus also said that this kingdom was arriving with him. Yeah, so for example, there's this really interesting story where there's a high ranking Roman officer and he comes to Jesus begging him to heal his servant. And he even calls Jesus his Lord, acknowledging that Jesus is his authority. Jesus praises this man for recognizing what no one else yet had, that not only was Jesus announcing God's kingdom, he was the king. And so the word gets out that this Jewish man from Galilee is talking and acting like he's the king of Israel. He's appointing 12 disciples, which are an image of Israel's 12 tribes. He's healing people forgiving people their sins. And all of this so threatened Israel's leaders that they finally decide to have him killed. And Jesus let them. Yeah, which is a weird thing to do if you're trying to become king. That's right, but for Jesus, this is what had to happen. Jesus saw the sin and the devastation of his people Israel as just one small part of the entire human condition. How all humanity has rebelled against God, resulting in the tragedy and devastation of our whole world. And so how is God going to bring his reign over such a world? Jesus believed it would be through an act of sacrificial love for his enemies. This is why in the Gospels, Jesus' crucifixion is depicted as his enthronement as the king of the Jews. Yeah, he receives a crown. He also receives a robe. He's exalted up, not onto a throne, but onto the cross. How beautiful are the feet that bring good news. And the good news now is that Jesus has defeated death and that he reigns as king, that he's dealt with our sin and corruption himself and that he's conquered it with his life and with his love. And then Jesus sends his followers to go out and keep announcing this good news of the upside down kingdom. And to invite everyone to give their allegiance to him, the king who defeated death with his love. There's something about, um, yeah. So um, uh, the Bible Project, it's a creative nonprofit studio that a friend and I started to make short animated films for adults <laughs> about all the books of the Bible and key themes that unite the whole story of the Bible. Um, the videos are all for free and uh, they're all on YouTube. Just Google the Bible Project. It's the first thing that'll come up. And if you like them and find them helpful, at the end of the video, we'll tell you where to go, contribute to the next video that we're uh, working on. 
Uh, but let me just, let me land the plane. <laughs> why we're here today, <laughs> what this is all about. Um, Jesus is so beautiful and so amazing, you guys. He changed my life. And I've watched him change the lives of so many people in the 20 years that I've had the privilege of following him. And this, he is such an amazing, complex, beautiful figure. There's, actually, there's no one story that can do him justice. The only kind of story that could do justice to Jesus is the epic narrative of the Bible. Are you with me? Every single part of the story, every subplot, every confusing thing that you had no idea how, it relates, dude. I'm telling you, it relates, right? It connects. There are a million spotlights shining on Jesus from the weird, obscure stories in the three quarters of the Bible we don't know what to do with. Only an epic narrative like this could do justice to the beauty of Jesus. The Bible is not simple. The Bible is very, it's challenging. It takes your whole brain, your whole heart, and all of your commitment to a community of people who are going to immerse themselves in this story and over a lifetime commit yourself to seeing how every part of this epic story leads to Jesus and, and when, when you invite people into this story, it messes with people. It does things to people. When you tell the story of Jesus, who was the truly human one, who was the image of God and the one who was a human that we are all made to be but perpetually fail to be. And when you tell the stories about how Jesus was the faithful Israelite who truly loved God and loved neighbor with the, at the cost of his life, and when you talk about a creator God who's so committed to the world, despite what we've done to it, that he would bind himself to it in the person of Jesus, that God would enter his own story and bind himself to humanity eternally because he loves us and because his love is what conquers our sin and our failure and our death. And it's precisely his love and creative life that offers hope. It offers hope to the drug addict, it offers hope to the tech nerd in Silicon Valley. It offers hope to the urban single mom. It offers hope to the suburban mom of four who are all playing soccer, right? To every kind of humanity finds its meaning and its hope in King Jesus. And that's what this story is about. And this is the story that we have the privilege and the great challenge of inviting our church communities into. And it will take a lifetime for you. I feel like I'm just scratching the surface of this thing. And I've given the last like 20 years to really going for it, you know? And it's, to, but to me, it's not about it being daunting. It's, it's a playground. Because every page and every part of its story highlights the beauty of the grace and the love of King Jesus. And so my, my ultimate hope is what you take away today is a new passion and a new kind of ig ignition in yourself to learn the Bible <laughs> and to understand this huge story and how it illuminates things about Jesus that you would have never, never seen before. And when we, have, when we share this wisdom with the world, like it, it affects people. And I believe this is one of our greatest callings as disciples of Jesus is not to hide the Bible by sanitizing it or shortening it so that we basically neuter the thing and its power in our culture and in people's lives. And so the Bible Project is the way, you know, that I've f found my own calling to do that. You're in a local church community with your circles of influence, but this is what we're called to do. We follow Jesus and we bear witness to him by knowing him and relating to him through the epic narrative of the scriptures. Amen? Amen. So I hope today's been uh, a, a service towards that end. Let me close in a word of prayer, so if that's okay. Jesus, we believe that you are beautiful. We, uh, we're compelled by your upside down kingdom. Uh, where love overcomes evil uh, because your love overcame our failures and our deepest flaws. 
and it overcame the hell that we have created here in your very good world. Jesus, have mercy on us. Forgive us for our short attention spans. Forgive us for our laziness. Give us a passion for you, for this epic story that bears witness to you. Give us a passion for our friends and neighbors whose view of themselves and whose view of the world is so impoverished because they don't know you. They don't know the richness of what you open up in the human story. And so we commit all of our efforts, all of our learning. We want to know you, and we want our friends and family and neighbors and coworkers to know you too. Holy Spirit, empower your church to bear witness to Jesus, and we pray in his name. Amen? Yeah, amen.